Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this um, meeting of the Executive Scrutiny Board on Monday, the 8th of April, 2024, 6 p.m. at the Council House in Derby. Um, first things first, we'll go through the agenda for the meeting. Uh, item one is any apologies, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this. No apologies, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. There is one late item that I'm aware of. Is there any other one done? Yeah. Um, which I'll take at the end of the agenda, if that's okay, because it could be um, quite be a lot of discussion on that one. Um, so I'll fit that in after item, after the um, council agenda, basically. Um, declarations of interest, please. I take it, and there are none. Um, Minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of March. Can I have a proposal and seconder, please? Councillor Mulhall, Councillor Khan, thank you. Forward plan. Anyone, anybody want to uh, raise anything on the latest version of the forward plan? Yes, Councillor Kerr, if I can remind you to announce yourself when you speak, please. Yes, Chair. I'm um, Lucy Kerr. I'm a councillor for Little Over. The, one of the changes highlighted in the forward plan document is the proposal for Infinity Park Derby to be part of a bid for an East Midlands Combined County Authority investment zone. Uh, I've got no problems with that, but if we have an investment zone, if we have new businesses coming in, potentially relocating from somewhere else and bringing with them staff that they already have because they want to expand or whatever, it will have not just impacts on our economy, it will also have impacts on our housing demand and our schools demand. And when this issue is being considered, I do want it to be looked at holistically. So whether at this point we want to just to emphasise to officers that we need to have a review, not just of the economic side of things, but the wider implications for this sort of thing happening to Derby, or whether we actually want to ensure that somebody scrutinises and, ask, and asks those questions in a public forum, I don't know. But one or, those other, one or other of those things, Chair, I think we should be doing. Thank you. Obviously, it's only just gone in the forward plan, um, so the detail won't be there. And I would hope that, the, as would normally be the case, that um, those sort of issues would be included in the papers that come forward on that. But I don't have any any issue whatsoever in recommending to them. So, they, Chair, I, I must apologise because I, I read this in great haste and drew a circle around it without reading it sufficiently. It actually went to last month's meeting. Um, and I was obviously too late for doing more than mentioning it, I think, last time. <laughs> okay, well, um, no problem then. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Anything else, Lucy, or anybody else in relation to the forward plan? Yes, Councillor Holmes. Thank you, Councillor Matthew Holmes, uh, Michalova Ward. Uh, just Chair, um, I'd probably invite your thoughts on this, actually, because on page 7, pro pro Project Ensemble, um, there seems to be, has been some progress, according to media reports and the deputy leader of the council's statements on in various media outlets of how, pro, how this is progressing, and dates potentially of demolition and all sorts of detail that, to my knowledge, this board, nor ONS, has actually received any reports. So I find it confusing, Chair, as to the seeming, seeming progress, but there doesn't seem to be any detail that's being scrutinised. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, my view, and, uh, and by all means, anybody officers want to contribute along the way, um, my view is that to an extent we've had, um, or Cabinet have seen a report on the subject in that there was a paper brought uh, to Cabinet recommending that the £20 million LUF funding no longer went towards Project Assemble, but towards a um, Guildhall project, which, and that's referenced in tonight's late item. So it's in that way it has been dealt with, but um, also I think Cabinet will have seen something in relation to the um, development of a development partner city in the city centre. But you're absolutely right, I don't think the detail has been there yet. There have been a variety of announcements of what ifs and cans and ambitions, if you like, but nothing that's been brought on paper. 
So um, at the same time, um, and I take it you're referring to um, references to work starting on demolition in October and such that, things. And that was true, Chair. I mean, um, as you know, I'm an advocate for, for clearing the site, uh, but I was surprised to hear the Deputy Leader of the Council state with some confidence that the planning condition had been resolved and demolition would occur. Uh, I'd stand corrected if this isn't exactly what she said, but uh, uh, later into this year, maybe into the autumn, early into the winter, that we'd see the site being demolished. I find that astonishing, considering we haven't any, had any detail to be scrutinised, Chair. And of course, one of the things that goes hand in hand with that is, is what we all know of a condition, a planning condition, that says that no demolition will take place until such times as um, a full business case is submitted for what will replace it. And um, there's no prospect or no detail or no uh, evidence that that will be available by the autumn. So um, I'm sure that Cabinet will be expecting um, detailed uh, reports on the subject in the not too distant future. But you're right to raise it. Anybody, any officers want to add anything to that? No? Okay. Who's going to be dealing with the guild hall tonight? You are, right, thank you. Yeah, Tammy, I think wanted to say something. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say that the, the, um, the detail will be brought forward. The planning condition hasn't yet been discharged, so Cabinet will see the detail. Um, on that, and we are actually at Regen scrutiny, so there will be an opportunity for, for officers to, uh, for elected members to, to look at the detail. I was going to say, I expect Regen scrutiny to, to want to see some of that. Did you say planning condition hasn't, or it has? It hasn't, no. Well, so that's where, um, some, in some quarters, it's been raised. The ambition to start demolition in the autumn has been raised as a problem with that not having yet been discharged, but I'm sure we'll see that in the future. Okay, anything else on the forward plan? No, in that case then, um, mm. Council Cabinet responses to scrutiny recommendations, the, the details or the lack of detail in terms of what was and what wasn't accepted at Cabinet uh, certainly wasn't made to make clear to me on the night um, officers have recorded a, a response from Cabinet in relation to all our responses, but again, as usual, most of them were negative and not, and not accepted by, by Cabinet. But the details are in the minutes of the, of the previous meeting and the Cabinet meeting. Any queries on that? Okay, that moves us straight swiftly on then to um, what I initially thought was quite a light agenda in terms of council cabinet, uh, the council cabinet agenda, but um, it's got a little bit more complicated over the weekend. So we'll crack on and go straight to item eight, which is the Derby Schools Capital Programme um, priority schemes for 24-25. Gamal, I take it. Thank you, Chair. And again, as an introduction, I'm Gamal as a director for commissioning. Um, so, Chair, this is a report that normally comes around this time of the year um, in relation to the school's capital programme for 24-25 in relation to maintenance schemes. Um, the Council is still waiting the formal allocation from the Department for Education for 24-25 for our community schools and foundation schools. Uh, but as the report outlines, we, we, we anticipate that being around um, £3 million. This report is seeking Cabinet um, to, to approve the schemes in order to uh, progress scheme development so that the some programme can be completed over the summer period in readiness, uh, but the contracts won't be awarded until the DfE um, give the final notification to all councils, which we expect imminently. Uh, the breakdown of the schemes are outlined in Appendix 2, uh, and Chair, the, the, the general um, kind of areas of expenditure or categories are outlined in 4.4 of the report, which is around boiler replacements, uh, building of fabric, structural works, um, roofing and window replacement. Um, in terms of um, climate change implications, all the schemes will be developed in, in accordance with the latest building regulation uh, approved documents. 
uh, and where possible schemes will be designed to allow for future improvements to move towards net zero carbon goals. But charity is important to outline these are um, sort of old schemes and you're, 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 you're trying to make condition improvements within that. Um, as I say, the, the list of proposed projects is outlined in the appendix uh, and the recommendations to Cabinet are to consider uh, and those recommendations are outlined between 2.1 and 2.5. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gamal. Um, some of those are longer in the tooth with the Council can remember a, a capital schools programme being significantly larger than it is now uh, with, the, um, with the onset of academies, particularly in the secondary school field. Um, just for my, do, do you know off the top of your head the number of um, uh, primary schools and secondary schools that remain under local authority? Uh, yeah, Chair, so, so in terms of secondary, it's primarily one, and in overall approximate number, I think we have about 35 maintained schools that we are responsible for. They're just approximate numbers. I'd need to go back to check, but they're, they're in those kind of ballpark figures. Okay, but this is an annual report that, that's got nothing unusual or out of kilter in it. And, no, Chair, and, the uh, only thing we're waiting for is, I mean, certainly there haven't been a lot of academy conversions during the year, so we'd like to think that the allocation um, is similar based on the number of schools we're responsible for and hopefully the overall um, sort of amount of funding coming through. So in that sense, Chair, there's nothing um, unusual in this report apart from um, kind of it would be good to have the DfE allocations much sooner um, than, than at the moment. It, it tends to come through very late. Okay, so yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Cecile Wright, Councillor uh, for Arboretum. Um, during the weekend, there was a, a Radio 4 programme that was looking at school maintenance and budgets, uh, and it uh, spoke about about the fact that schools are placed in a position of uh, recruiting staff and maintaining their schools. I assume that that was referring to academies. Um, and it also talked about schools being tied to PFI contracts and how those contracts are deleterious in the sense that schools really are having to pay high prices for maintenance, etc. I don't suppose it applies to here, does it? Given that it is local authority, uh, is a council, uh, yes, local authority maintained. So I don't suppose schools are at a disadvantage. They don't have to use their own budget to maintain the school. Please, could you clarify? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Chair, just to, just to confirm that that is correct in the sense of the schemes on this programme for our maintained schemes or the sorts of schemes expenditure that schools wouldn't be able to afford. And while schools do get maintenance funding, it tends to be smaller amounts, not to, to this, this scale. Uh, and, and Chair, in terms of PFI, they're outside of this. They're in that PFI um, life cycle um, process. So these are primarily condition maintenance where um, we want to ensure uh, um, those minimum condition improvements are done so there isn't a risk of um, building closures or such like to preempt some of some of those um, aspects. Okay. Any other queries, questions? Yes, Councillor Kerr. Thank you, Lucy Kerr. The um, uh, can I compl um, compliment whoever wrote the climate implications because I, I appreciate the honesty in paragraph nine point one, and I think the the Roundel diagram is one of the better ones I've seen. Uh, however. I, uh, and I, I also appreciate the comments about trying to do some preparatory work for the future. And aligned with this, I wondered whether how closely people, the department is working with schools and their aspirations. Um, because, for example, where we have got heating systems going in, are we building in the opportunity for solar water heating, which a school might be able to afford? a single unit panel and then a second single unit panel from their own fundraising resources, which could significantly cost that, reduce their costs during um, a term and a half of the year. So it's whether or not we're, we're doing that liaising with our central thinking about um, climate and sustainability, but together with the school's premises committee or, or whatever they have, and whether we're maximising that opportunity at this time. 
Um, and when we're talking about hybrid heating systems, and I got to hybrid heating systems, and I thought, ah, oh, great, it's going to include some solar water heating, but no, it's an air-sourced heat pump. And I wondered whether we were actually looking at solar water heating as one of those com combination ones. That particular quote was from the Alveston Infant and Nursery School. Um, there's, and there's a, another strange anomaly here in that Murray Park School is apparently putting in um, double-glazed units, whereas Row Farm Primary is putting in triple-glazed units. And I wondered why we have that difference. Um, and where we've got... If the, where we've got roof replacements, and there's a mention of a roof replacement in um, Rose Hill, I think, um, whether we are looking at putting in PV tiles rather than standard tiles, and again, whether the, the school might be engaged with to achieve that, or we might even be suggesting we could go and look at the Climate Change Capital Fund and do that at the same time when we're re-roofing and whether those have been explored. But the general tenor of the report, I am appreciative of. Thank you. So, Camille, thank you. Um, compliments on, on that section of the report. You may or may not know the answer to the detail there. Perhaps you can get back to Councillor Care or get somebody to get back to Councillor Care on the subject. Yes, Chair, it would be easy to take some of those back. Some of these are technical detail. But thank you for the positive comments. And certainly, Chair, briefly, um, um, we will kind of liaise with schools around whether there's opportunity to join up, but there are pressures into schools' budgets because, as you outlined, Chair, earlier in terms of reduction in maintenance funding, the devolved funding that schools used to get to be able to join up is also uh, also less than it has been before. But happy to take those back as technical questions, and I'll, I'll come back to Councillor Kerr. Thank you. Anything else from anybody? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's, um, just a quick question about sorry, the... Sorry, Martin, just... Oh, sorry. Um, Councillor Martin Rawson for uh, Chaddiston West Ward. Um, just a quick question from... Um, going back to the climate change issue and the replacement of the boilers. Um, um, I notice a couple of them are sort of hybrid schemes with gas and um, uh, air source um, heat pumps. Um, do we have a policy of... Um, using the, the greenest technology that we can, which obviously would be an air source, um, if at all possible, um, and trying to sort of phase out gas. I know it will be individual circumstances, probably at individual schools, but if it, um, that would obviously be the ideal if, if that was the, um, the aim that we worked to. Thank you, thank you, Chair. There's no firm policy, but certainly we do aspire to do that, because sometimes, um, Chair, it can be difficult on uh, dated heating systems and to try and move away from sort of gas um, towards, towards air source. So there isn't a policy and it would be one or the other, but each scheme is looked at on an individual basis to say where are the opportunities for sustainability features to be incorporated as part of um, that technical design. Question, Martin? Yes. Okay. Councillor Kerr's back in. Yeah, can I, can I pick up that point from um, Councillor Rawson and s suggest maybe that is something we should be recommending to Cabinet, that they um, put together a, a programme or policy on how they're going to move forward um, in terms of, of combining the, the a, as a climate aspiration alongside the maintenance? I think, Councillor Kerr, we do, do we do already have a condition or a, a section in the in the report's phase of anything like this to take full account of climate change issues and to to detail that in, or in a recommendation. We could you could have recommendation after recommendation. No, I no. think the detail the detail will be there in each each report and could be considered at each report. I don't know if anybody else feels any stronger. Okay. Right, anything else? No, nope. thank you, Gamal. I think we'll, uh, the, uh, the uh, exec scrutiny can resolve to note the report. Okay, thank you. Moving on into item nine, Simping Golf Course, uh, updating next steps. I think presumably oh, it's, um, it's Emily. Thank you, Chair. Emily Feenan, Director of Corporate Governance, Property and Procurement. Um, this report um, seeks Cabinet's approval, well, firstly to note that the current tenant of Simfin Golf Course wishes to surrender its lease of the golf course 
on or before the 31st of August this year, and that earlier this year, the Council appointed specialist agents to undertake a comprehensive marketing exercise to identify a new external operating tenant for the golf course. And secondly, seeks um, approval from Cabinet to um, delegate authority to myself in consultation with um, Section 151 Officer and the Cabinet Member to negotiate an enter into a new lease in respect to the golf course. Members may be aware that Sheffield City Trust is the current operator of Symphon Golf Course. Symphon, um, so Sheffield City Trust um, is moving out of leisure operations and golf course operation and wishes to hand back the operation of the golf course to the council. As the golf course has been outsourced for a number of years, the council no longer has the in-house expertise um, or resources to operate the golf course itself and is therefore undertaken a process to identify a new operator for the course. The Council app appointed a specialist um, agent to undertake that marketing, a company called HMH Golf and Leisure, who undertook the marketing and of the course. Um, that marketing exercise recently closed at the um, beginning of March. Six bids were received by the closing date and that those bids are in the process of being evaluated. Um, it's proposed that the new lease will pass on responsibility for all repairs and maintenance of the golf course and the associated buildings. And it's also, we're hoping to include the building known, which is known as Cotton Farm, which is on the site. Cotton Farm is currently not within the lease um, operated by she Sheffield City Trust, but we would like to incorporate it within the new lease going forward so that that building would come under the maintenance responsibility of the new operator. It's proposed that the council will grant a long lease in excess of 25 years, so as to maximise the opportunity for investment over time in the course. Obviously, the, the operator will be looking to operate the course on a commercial basis, but there will be requirements on the operator to have a pricing scheme that's consistent and aligned to local market rates and that allows access for all sections of the community. The operator will be expected to um, program, have a programme of use that meets all needs and will also be required to continue to liaise closely um, and work in partnership with Derby Golf Course. Um, this report is brought forward now so as to allow the necessary approvals to be in place to allow um, negotiation with the preferred bidder to take place over the next couple of months and for the new lease to be entered into in plenty of time before the surrender at the end of August. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> yes, thank you. Um, so, potentially, um, very positive, um, potentially very positive news. Uh, we do know that alterations to golf courses can be quite controversial. Are there any consultation plans in relation to the, uh, into the, in relation to this, and in terms of delegating the authority to yourself and other officers to do the deal? Um, if in, if it became controversial at some point for some reason, um, will it be brought back to cabinet or to the relevant scrutiny board? Thank you, Chair. So it's not the golf course will continue to operate essentially as a golf course as it currently is now with all the same facilities. Um, the bids that have come forward do um, indicate a degree of investment in the course and the site, and obviously any um, plans to build additional golfing facilities on the site would require necessary approvals and planning consents etc so would be covered up in that way there's no um proposals for any further consultation given that the use of the site will continue in its current format um the delegations are in place to take this forward obviously were there to be any significant changes outside of the um current proposals to award a, a new lease for a period of around 25 years for the operation of the golf course, then that would be considered with the cabinet member and a decision would be taken whether further approvals would be required. Okay, I think um, actually the committee, the, the question, but I think it's quite reasonable in the circumstances to ask that the details of, uh, of any final agreement and the, and the operator are uh, in the spirit of openness and transparency reported to 
the relevant scrutiny board? Is that a reasonable request? Uh, the relevant scrutiny board would be? I think that would be the communities in place. Yeah. Yeah, just as a check and balance, I think perhaps we'd ask for all the details to be reported to that scrutiny board. Thank you. The recommendation. Yes, Councillor Eyre. Uh, thank you, Chair. Councillor Matthew Eyre, Oakwood Ward. Uh, I'm enti entirely in agreement with that recommendation, uh, but I know exactly what the Leader of the Council will say to that because he's been very dismissive of any recommendation that's taken that tone before around uh, a recommendation to a Chair of a Board. Uh, I'd like the recommendation to stand. I'm even happy to second that one. Um, but as the present chair of the Communities Board, I'll certainly put it on my agenda. Uh, if I'm the chair of the Scrutiny Board after um, May, I'm happy to keep it on the agenda um, for that as well, but would very much support uh, that recommendation. More than anything, just notification of chairs by officers of um, a development and a change like that, which would allow a chair of a committee to ensure it is on a Scrutiny Board, uh, is always welcomed, I think, despite, as I said, the dismissive comments the Leader of the Council has made before. Um, a couple of very quick questions uh, from me, if I can. I think I've got three so far. So it's mainly around that 4.4 and the inclusion of Cotton Farm. Uh, so Cotton Farm isn't really a building I'm that familiar with. So can I just check, what, what's the sort of current status of Cotton Farm? Was there any particular reason that we can gather it wasn't included before? And do we have any view in terms of what we would like a future operator to do with that particular building? Is it just a case of carrying out the repairs? Is it a case of a specific kind of regeneration of it? Do we have any views? Thank you, Councillor Eyre. Uh, Cotton Farm is a small hall type building. Um, it is not listed. Um, but it is in a very poor state of repair. It was previously, when the golf course was under the City Council's operation, used for storage of grounds maintenance type equipment, things like that. Um, over time, that's stopped and the, the cotton farm is essentially boarded up and has not been accessed and is not, as I say, it's not part of the current demise. Um, the view is that there is value in that in the hall for the operation of the golf course, particularly if the golf course, um, the bids we've received are all very ambitious for the future operation of the site and the course. And so it gives additional building capacity on the site, which um, not all bidders are interested in, but some definitely are interested in exploring the opportunity of including it within, for their operational purposes. Brilliant. Thanks, Emily. Uh, in that case, given the, obviously the nature of the bids that it sounds like we've got, I don't see any need to put a recommendation forward, but it sounds like officers were going to do it anyway, but my encouragement to the Cabinet is if there's any way within the negotiations we can ensure that a future operator will make the best use of that building, let's make sure that we're doing that. Thank you, Chair. Sadly, I wanted to highlight on this one, again, the climate implications which has a the standard diagram, which is interesting. And there are potentially a number of opportunities for a new operator to impact positively on climate change, either through their own work or by working with and influencing others, such as the council. Um, it's the, the one which is clearly, because it's a fairly large land-based use, which you could be doing something, um, has a negative nine on adaptation, which is is strange in itself, but um, how this is definitely going to be impacting on transport, on, on less waste, on less energy, it, it is definitely a strange one. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, I think we may be in a situation where my the officers present don't know the actual detail and to be, to be able to answer you properly, I may have to get back to you, but I'll give you the opportunity to do so. Thank you, Chair. No, if if uh, Councillor has some specific questions about the uh, climate implication, I'm happy to take those away and provide answers. I would say that um, within some of the bids received, there are proposals in relation to environmental sustainability of the site and how um, that can be improved um, within the bids that we've received. So it is something which is on the mind of the operators of how they can um, work sustainably on the site. Okay, in the absence of any other queries, Evelyn, you mentioned 25 years plus for a, how much plus are we talking? That's something that the operator, that the bidders have put forward as proposals. So um, 
When we went out a number of years ago originally for this proposal, actually we went out with quite a short lease. It was only 15 years and um, the level of market interest was quite limited at the time. There were reasons for that at the time. But it has inhibited investment. You know, if you were looking to invest in something like a driving range, for example, with considerable borrowing, that requires a period of time to, for payback of that investment. So what we've recognised is that we need to be more flexible in terms of the um, lease. The council is committed to having a golf course in that area, and that's the land use that's foreseen on that site. So a long lease is seen as... Um, it secures the continued operation of a golf course on that site, but also gives the um, opportunity for greater investment in the site. And the bidders have come back with different proposals on the length of lease. So, in effect, uh, negotiable, in effect. Absolutely, Chair. Okay. Any other things to add? Or Yes, Councillor. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Martin Rawson, Chadiston West Ward. Um, yeah, just to... Um, say what um to welcome this really it sounds like a really um a, a really positive step forward and um um the point about the lease i think is that the the longer lease that you can offer the greater the investment that um somebody's likely to be able to put in so um i do um i personally support a long lease because that would encourage um maximum investment in from um, in, into the um uh, into the grounds and the buildings, as, as we've heard. I um, don't know if we can make that a recommendation, but um, that's my view anyway. Thank you. Uh, that's for you as a committee to decide if, it's, if you think it's necessary. I'm happy to put one forward if you've got something in mind that you want to put forward. Yeah, I've, I'm, I'm sure Cabinet are aware, but... Um, it, and, and, and officers as well during the negotiations, so it's, it's probably not worth um, worthwhile. But um, I think it's uh, it's just worth making the point. Um, and officers have uh, heard that. Thank you. Okay. In that case, then I think we, as a committee, can resolve to note the report going forward. Thank you very much. Item ten then is the uh, redevelopment of a site in Derby to provide affordable homes. Who's going to do this one? Karen? Thank you, Chair. Um, so this item is... Uh, sorry, Karen Briley, Principal Housing Development Manager. Um, so this report seeks the approval for the addition of a new scheme to the capital programme uh, for the purchase and subsequent redevelopment of a site within the Abbey Ward of Derby to provide accommodation which will initially be used to discharge our homelessness duties and then subsequently for those um, that are um, eligible for affordable housing on Home Finder. Um, to outline uh, the actual concept, and then I'll revert back to the recommendations. At the moment, we face unprecedented pressures um, for, uh, house, for social housing in Derby. Um, we have some of the longest waiting lists that we have ever had in the city. That's for social housing and for um, reports coming or people coming to us um, needing accommodation, uh, temporary accommodation and bed and breakfast accommodation. Um, we are all aware of the uh, poor quality um, life standard um, that people that are living in bed and breakfast accommodation face. Um, we also have um, delivery of affordable housing as a council priority. Um, we have identified a site which is currently vacant and in private ownership, which consists of um, a number of blocks um, of flats, and um, we feel that that site can be brought into use quite quickly to provide um, respite for the B&B &B, um, accommodation situation. Um, we have undertaken negotiations with the vendor, and an offer has been um, agreed subject to cabinet approval for it. Um, we have looked at the benefits to the families that would move in um, and the property can be refurbished to eventually provide a total of 96 apartments. They would be a mix of two, three, five and six bedroom flats. This would all be family accommodation. Um, so there would be no single persons or couples um, accommodation within the site. 
Um, the site also has the potential capacity for further new build, so we can actually do some um, freestanding new build or some extension to the existing accommodation, um, although that has not been um, included at this time. The proposal would be for um, the initial properties, um, 46 flats to be brought into use by the end of August, and then a rolling programme of refurbishment would occur across the site um, to provide the uh, full 96 um, properties. Um, at the moment, the decision as to whether the property would be held in the HRA or the general fund, um, it's a very complex um, aspect um, and we are waiting for further recommendations on that. So we have requested a, a delegation um, with regards to that aspect. Um, we have undertaken um, extensive discussions with Derby Homes who would actually manage the properties on our behalf. They would also have on-site staff accommodation so that they were able to manage um, and offer support to the people, to the families that are living there. Um, we have also um, notified the ward councillors um, of the proposal. Um, we have looked at other options to not purchase and redevelop the site, um, but that, that option um, is not recommended um, as it's generally felt that it would be brought into use um, almost as HMO accommodation for single people rather than family accommodation. Um, we don't gain anything by actually partnering with one of our RP partners um, and we've also explored whether there is an alternative site that we could purchase and remodel um, but we've not been able to identify anything that would actually offer us the um, benefits that this site do. We've also explored the um, practicality of purchasing 96 individual properties and again the timescales that that would take it doesn't offer us the um, instant opportunity to uh, move 46 families out of B&B accommodation. Um, we have actually looked at the um, costs and we have identified various funding streams that can be utilised to um, contribute towards this. Mm -hmm. We have also been offered um, LAHF round two um, funding which would support the acquisition and refurbishment um, of the property. Um, we are also looking at the use of unring fenced right to buy receipts, um, some additional um, wraparound support funding, um, some unallocated section 106 receipts, um, and a capital receipt from the sale of um, an adjoined property to the site. Um, we are proposing that the scheme is added to the capital programme um, and that, uh, like I say, we would come back with regards to which uh, fund it is held in. Um, it does, the report does outline the timescales um, of the um, DULUC uh, LAHF funding. Um, the, there are principal financial risks to the project. Again, they are outlined in the report. Um, there are again legal implications but we will appoint an external design team um, we are looking at derby homes bringing the property into use initially we will undertake further discussions with them and either they will do the full refurbishment works or we can appoint an external contractor through one of our compliant frameworks um, because this is an existing property and we would actually be improving and upgrading the property um, it does actually come out reasonably well we feel on the climate implications um, because we don't have the uh, carbon implications of a new build property. Um, this would also provide uh, further affordable homes for the, the residents of Derby. So our recommendations are to agree to the principle of the purchasing and the redevelopment of the site as detailed in the confidential version of the report. Uh, to approve the addition to the capital program um, of the scheme for the purchase and the redevelopment. Um, we ask for a delegation to the strategic director of place in consultation with the section 151 officer and the cabinet member for housing, property and regulatory services to determine whether the property should be held and funded by the HRA or the general fund. Um, there is also a delegation requested for um, authority to the director of finance 
um, following consultation again with the strategic directors, uh, director of communities and the cabinet member to agree the final funding streams to be used um, to deliver the scheme. Um, a delegation to the strategic director of place in consultation with the um, section 151 and cabinet member to agree the terms to allow the council to enter into all the contracts and agreements necessary to deliver the project within the approved budget. Um, a delegation to the director of finance and section 151 officer following consultation with the cabinet member to enter into the LAHF funding agreement subject to acceptable grant conditions and for the property to be incorporated within the housing stock and managed and maintained by Derby Homes and to recommend approval at full council to approve the additional unsupported with corporate borrowing for the purchase and refurbishment of the site. Thank you, Karen. Um, again, on the face of it, a relatively positive proposal, uh, particularly when you bear in mind 96 properties available to house people who are either homeless or in serious need, albeit on a potentially temporary basis, can only be a, a big benefit to the housing, housing situation in the city. Councillor Bolton, you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Sarah Bolton, Councillor for Blakeleys Ward. Um, I think this is a no-brainer, really, thinking of the situation we face. And if you look at 4.4, with the <clears throat> applicants we have re registered for our social housing through the Home Finder scheme and the amount of applicants we have there, as well as people who have are at the moment in bed and breakfast. And I find that obviously appalling in this day and age that we should have children living in highly inappropriate bed and breakfasts for such accommodation and the effect that has on the families and children themselves. I understand from the office of the risks attached to this, uh, but clearly we have got dreadful issues of housing inappropriately with throughout the city. So I think this scheme, um, whilst obviously it won't eradicate the whole situation, but will go a long way in helping families and children who are inadequately housed at the moment. My question is, <coughs> excuse me, when these properties do become available, would it be possible if we could house the families with children in appropriate buildings first? Because having children in bed and breakfast, <coughs> excuse me, it's just not appropriate in my view, and I, I clearly understand that this will be managed and run by Derby Homes. Um, but I was wondering how Derby Homes will decide who goes where. And I would ask that this committee think about very carefully, and hence me raising it now, that the, the families uh, with children should perhaps be looked at at a priority basis so that those children have better life starts than they are at the present time. Thank you. I suspect the officers are able to give that reassurance. There will be a plan as to the, the allocation of these properties, I take it, Karen? Yeah, as in 4.4, um, uh, 4, we have got 170 families in bed and breakfast accommodation or other overnight accommodation. So um, this accommodation would actually target 49, uh, 46 families initially, and then it would all be aimed at families. Um, so, yeah, it would all be... Uh, families with children. Do you therefore, uh, Councillor Bolton, want to put in a recommendation from this board that uh, in terms of allocation priorities, children and families with children are given first priority? Yes, I think that would be a sensible option if it's supported, Chair. Councillor Mulhall? Yeah, um, no, I was just going to say that I think there is... Oh, yes, yeah, so, uh, Councillor Mulhall, Oakwood Ward. <clears throat> um, I think this is probably the first time we will have political consensus on this uh, scrutiny committee, which is a pleasant surprise. Um, but no, I'm just going to say that I fully support um, what Councillor Bolton's just suggested, so I'm happy to second her recommendation. Okay, I think we can do that then. Um, Councillor Kerr. Thank you. Um, the, my understanding was it was designed for families, so, so hopefully that will be accepted by Cabinet as well. The, I had just a few points on here, in that, I, and I, I'll start by saying that I like the climate roundel on this one as well, it seems to make sense. But to, to build on that, um, I'm hoping that the, the design 
maybe initially, but certainly finally, will include um, cycle parking, whether we can work with the Lime Electric Cycle Group, whether to have an electric cycle on board. It seems to me an ideal place for having a car club, club base, um, in the same way as we have the electric car clubs on site here, maybe we could, to, could work with them to put one there. Um, and, and the question is, we've got 16 blocks, and one of them is not going to have anything done to it until next March, and it's not going to be used. Why are we not able to use that 16th block, at least for six months or so? Um, we've actually looked at it, and if we actually, the, the um, three flats are in a single block, so it, that block would be kept kept vacant. That allows us to do some um, destructive survey work on that block, which we couldn't do if somebody was actually resident um, in there. Um, but in addition, it allows us to, um, we wouldn't have to move anyone out from there to be able to then refurbish it. Um, so it, it allows us that flexibility that we can refurbish and then people would move into that block that are currently on site and that would then vacate another block, and we could then go in and refurbish it, and that's how we would get our rolling programme. So, yes, initially, we do have a vacant block, um, but, it, like I say, it does offer, offer us the opportunity for um, any further survey work that we need to do and for um, more access um, for um, detailed drawings and taking measurements and things such as that. So I think a rolling program of maintenance is, is, a, is a very laudable plan. Uh, Councillor Moorhall? Uh, yeah, uh, cheers, Chair. It's just, um, I've got a question around some of the principal financial risks, so 7.11. Uh, I understand that, obviously, some of them are a bit generic because, you know, we don't quite know what delays we might, um, might crop up. But I've got a question around uh, the second from the bottom one. So we'll start it. PMO Gateway 3, so I'm a project manager and I'm just not 100% sure what risk will start at PMO Gate 3. Could you just elaborate as to what that means, please? Thank you. Um, so the council has a uh, PMA, PMO Gateway process. Um, normally a project would go in at Gateway um, 1, which is an initial concept, um, and then it would go through at uh, Gateway 2, which would be the outline business case, we are going in at Gateway 3 um, on a full business case. Um, so it's just if PMO pick up um, any aspects of it, it's really highlighting to councillors that we have not actually gone through the PMO Gateway 1 and 2. Okay. As the, can I ask, has the issue of planning permission been resolved or not planning permission been resolved yet? Um, I have actually um, been in touch with the planners um, and the sui generis um, uh, current use, um, we would be able to bring the property into use under that sui generis and um, we could then still apply for a planning change of use to C3, which is um, a, a domestic dwelling. Um, so we would do that, uh, but yes, we can bring it into use under sui generis. And the planners are supportive of a change to C3. But even a change to C3 could prove controversial locally in terms of its change of use? Um, yes, it, it could. Um, but the it would hopefully give residents, local residents, more assurance that it is actually going to be used um, as a family accommodation rather than the current sui generis, which would allow for a variety of unknown um, and unidentified uses. Okay. So the other issue that's raised for me, and you and I have been in discussion in the last few days about, about this, this query, is really uh, we all know the, the urgency and the need for housing for homeless families, etc., etc., and, and I've already commented that this would go a good way towards easing that situation. But it did raise for me the, the question, which I didn't know the answer to, and thank you for giving me the answer, is how the, there is extreme pressure on the home finder situation in terms of people applying and, and for years and being on the list for years. And, and increasingly for me, there's a, 
reports of um, council-owned properties coming, uh, becoming vacant and then not hitting the home finder situation in terms of, I get examples in Spondens, that people become aware that a council house has been vacated, but they look for it on home finder and it never appears. So my question to you was, under what circumstances does it not hit the home finder um, scenario and how many are, you know, in recent past, how many are there that have been dealt with other than going on to home finder? I've got a note of the numbers. Did you want, do you want me to repeat them or have you got them handy? So the, your answer was effectively, there, in the recent period, there were 501 um, houses became available. Uh, there were a total of 124 that, were, that didn't go on to Home Finder. But there were a number of reasons for that, uh, in that are uh, possible reasons for that. One could be um, they're allocated because of general needs or priority needs or even corporate needs. And the allocations have been made to, uh, in particular, to uh, 67 families in temporary accommodation, which is good, 17 care leavers, and 40 others. It's it's just the total amount, the total percentage is about 20 percent. Is it or just under 20 percent? Um, so. I don't know what uh, committee's thoughts on that are, if that's an acceptable level of, do we need to somebody, do we need to understand as local councillors how it is that some of these properties aren't hitting the, the market councillor care? I, I find this situation really difficult, as I know most people do, because we have so many people in, in desperate need of housing and we have so few properties coming up and available for them. If they go on to Home Finder, it's, it can give people the perception that there are more properties that they could be bidding for. But the people who are most in need are those families in bed and breakfast, those families in temporary accommodation, who are going to be the ones who win, if you like, win that property that goes on Home Finder. So it gives a perception of more properties being available but actually no greater chance of being able to bid successfully for one. So I, I personally think that if we're actually meeting the needs of those who are greatest in need, but still having some that are going through to Home Finder, we are balancing the desperate need with the need for choice as well. I guess my, the, the confusion for me comes whereby Absolutely, those in the most need need to, need to be allocated, and Derby Homes have the unenviable task of, of deciding that. But I have to say that I expected that on more occasions um, the allocation would be done by the urgency and need and the, and the, the, um, the most priority needs of the people on Home Finder. If you know what I mean. So, if there's a young, if there's a family in temporary accommodation with two children and effectively homeless, I would expect them to be at the top of the ladder of Home Finder. But it would still show on Home Finder who it's allocated to. It's, I just think there's, and I don't know the detail enough yet, but it it opens the door to people um, getting allocation of, of a house without, in circumstances which people don't understand, if you know what I mean, or probably getting in through the side door, excuse the expression. So I, I would like to, Karen, if you could do it for me, get um, give members of the committee some more detail on on that, in, and some detail how that works out, and maybe share that with the, mem the chair and the members of the Housing and Communities Board, would it be? The relevant, the, the relevant scrutiny board, anyway. We can work with Derby Homes to, to produce further information for you. Yes, please. And see where we go from that. Yes, Councillor yeah, Wright. Uh, uh, Councillor Wright, Arboretum Ward. Uh, to extend what you've just said, perhaps we need to have more details uh, as to how priorities are, are constructed, formulated, and how allocation are then made accordingly. Perhaps if we could have greater guidance... Uh, more detail with respect to that, that would be very helpful. 
I've ref very roughly outlined those, and there can be a number of circumstances yeah. where yeah. priorities are given. But the question for me is, can they not be given uh, on, as part of Home Finder, if you like? Why do they have to be dealt with separately in some circumstances? So perhaps so we can we add that. Yeah, and if we, have, if we get the numbers and they get the detail, then we can assess whether or not it needs to be taken any further. Okay. Yes, Councillor Holmes. Just quickly, Chair. I, yeah, I think I, I totally agree with what you said. I, I think summing it up in my mind is more transparency. It doesn't mean necessarily the system is incorrect or, or anything else. It just transparency builds confidence and obviously we'll explain to councillors exactly what the process is. We'll understand it. And in your case, when you do get queries about it, you'll have far more confidence in actually relaying that back to ward residents as to what the pro process actually is. And we'll offer that transparency to them as well to understand it. So I think it absolutely will be a very positive thing to do. Just to expand on the scenario is, you know, Ms. Mrs. Smith comes to me and says, I know that this house on Cambridge Street became available. It never hit home finding because I looked for it. But I know that Mrs. Jones from down the road and her two family have been allocated to that house. How does that happen? And I got no answers. So it's um, a yeah, transparency in the process, I think, if that can be uh, discussed in, in a, a bit of a paper, a bit of a report to this committee and the relevant scrutiny board. I'll get something compiled um, and we'll, we'll feed back on that. Appreciate that. Thank you. So any other queries or questions? I think it's a report that clearly we can welcome and, and also note. Is that okay? Good. Moving on then. Um, item 11 is compliance with <coughs> contract and procedure rules. We'll be doing that. Thank you, Chair. I'm Tony Nash, Head of Finance. Um, this report deals with four main items and the associated delegations. The first is a bid for an acceptance of new funding of £344,000 from the Football Foundation to develop a play zone facility in Alveston Park. It also asks for delegated authority to the Strategic Director of Place, the Section 151 Officer, in, consult in consultation with the Cabinet Member to accept funding and add the, a new play zone scheme to the capital programme as appropriate. The total project cost is £534,000 and this will be funded through a grant contribution, the grant contribution outlined and £190,000 of match funding contained within the Parks Capital Programme. This facility will be designed in partnership with local communities to ensure that the final, final design and surface works for football and other sports and activities are identified in that area. The premise of a play zone is that they are financially sustainable facilities allowing for income to be generated through a pay and place system. The second item is acceptance of grant from the... Sorry, can we, can we um, deal with each, each item as we go, please, if that's all right? Yeah. So the first, the first item is this play zones funding. Any questions or queries on that, Councillor Kerr? Thank you. We, there was a report, um, Chair, that you probably remember, which came to about a year or so ago about the investment in uh, tennis courts where again there was a, a pay and play process in place for that so um, you book an hour, hourly slot and um, the, the one of those is on the edge of Little Overward and I very rarely see anybody using it because the, the charge is either £8 or £5 an hour or very occasionally free. This week, for example, um, the, a couple of the free slots, I think three of the, three of the free slots had been taken, but nothing else had been booked. Despite the weather beginning to get better and um, it being school holiday. So my concern about this is that we, we price the facility at a level which actually means it's used. So yes, we, we're seeking to make um, sufficient income from it to maintain it, but can we keep the, the pricing mechanism under review so that we are actually getting people booking it and making use of it and it doesn't become a white elephant? Absolutely agree with your concern, but actually my understanding of the play zones system is that um, there's a, a large element of community involvement in the, in the running of the facility. 
For example, uh, there's one already gone in at Normanton Park. I think it's sporting communities. have got are invested in in running that, and and we'll price their structure accordingly. Uh, this one at um, Alveston Park, I think, is there are other there are other sporting facilities run on a pay to pay and play basis on the on the park. So they will certainly take that into account. But at the principle of um, it not being just the council setting the rates or running these play zones is well established. Duncan, I don't know if you want to say any more on that. Yes, uh, Duncan County, Head of Climate and, and Environment. Yeah, um, regarding the tennis sites have been popular, um, more so at Marquine Park and, and Darley Fields, and of course they are particularly a lot more busy um, as we approach the summer and Wilmwood and, and things like that. So. It's not a, not a big surprise that they're not particularly busy, given given the weather, which, which you've mentioned, and it is, it is starting to improve. Yes, um, Alveston Park, um, that particular site, it's anticipated that we'll be the council will be running that, as opposed to other sites where we might be looking for partners to get involved in. Uh, but there'll be, as the more team sports, there'll be a lot of people involved, and um, there's a programme of use that's been developed. We anticipate that that further usage should make it affordable. And, the, the, and there can be times where it's three for three as well as pay to use. So the one, so the one that struck me about this was that I'm aware that play zones, there are a number of proposals being considered across the city. As I say, one in Normanton Park already established, this one in Alveston, looking at one in Spondon, I think one at Caxton. Um, my concern was the level of um, match funding coming from the parks programme for this one in Elverston being 195,000. And my query was, and I've had it answered to a degree, if there's say four or five play zones being considered, if there's match funding of 195K in relation to all four or five of those, then that uses up the, the allocation for parks funding that was made provision for in the budget this year. And, and that's not what they, that intend, that increase in Parks funding was intended for. Can you explain where we're at with that, please? Yeah, this particular site's a, a double play zone, so it's it's double the cost, if you like, of the other ones that may come forward. There's no decisions on any others that might come forward, uh, and the, the the match funding for this, there's, um, I think you're probably talking about the unsupported capital borrowing that's recently been approved. Yeah, there'll be very little of that that will be needed for this because there's um, proposed that. There's 146,000 available from the RCTR River Sports Mitigation Fund, so that's allocated for it, as well as some Section 106. So it's very, a very small amount might be needed from the fund that you're aware of. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I think we should all be quite supportive of this initiative, and particularly where um, it's providing facilities such as this uh, around the wider city. Um, and I'm aware, say, for example, the one at Spondon, if there is, there'll be some unsupported borrow or some funding required for that. But we're looking at 106 funding, maybe, to, to allocate to that. So I think as a, as a committee, we maybe should be conscious that we, uh, we that I don't want, or I don't think we should want um, the new allocation of parks funding to be uh, consumed mm -hmm. by the by the place owns procedure and that cabinet should recommend that um, wherever possible um, as much as as much extra funding that's required is sourced from other sources is that a recommendation we can go with councillor Hope? chair I, I would suggest slightly slightly bolder really that it shouldn't be taken from that pot a challenge to find the money and not take it from, I'm assuming, what each of our wards will, will uh, benefit from. Um, this is fantastic. Yeah, it's great for those wards, but I certainly wouldn't support money, for example, being taken away from much-needed investment in Michelover play, area, play areas to top up this funding. I think they should be creative in finding the required fund, if there is required funds, from elsewhere, Chair. So, to strengthen it to the point of... Um a recommendation to avoid match funding coming from the general parks um, funding allocation 
and uh, um, supportive funding is, is sourced from elsewhere. I would second that, I would second that, Chair. Councillor Kerr. Chair, I was wondering if we could turn this round the other way, that there's, there's clearly been um, engagement here with the Friends of Elverston Park, and most of our parks, if not all of them now, have Friends of groups who are in a better position often to bid for money than the councillors themselves. They can access other things. So I would have thought a recommendation to work actively with rele relevant Friends of Parks to be able to bring in additional funding to, funding to avoid need to use might be the way to phrase it. We probably don't need to be specific about Friends of Parks, but other interested parties to source funding well, from elsewhere. Yes, Councillor. Chair, if that for me, it could be an and, and then something along the lines of what Councillor Kerr has proposed. I mean, I would support that too. Okay. Duncan, any, any particular problem with that recommendation? No, but if I may, I'd just like to make one particular point about the, that park's cap, capital funding that's, 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 that's very welcome. It, it is there to, to, uh, to, to help refurbish, if you like, existing infrastructure that's much needed across the city when you think about the amount of parks infrastructure that there is. And those two courts and Elveston have been sort of derelict for 10 plus years. So I'm, I'm, not, arguing, I'm what, not arguing against yeah. Elveston Park, but I'm conscious that um, parks uh, additional funding has been limited for a long time and that the current allocation is over three years, 500,000 a year, very easily, not very quickly, if we, if we allow it to onto schemes that require match funding. Dom, have you got, can you make something of that? So, recommend to Cabinet that they avoid, oh sorry, recommendation that Cabinet avoid match funding coming from general parks funding and that funding is sought from other funding parts and from other interested parties. Uh, from friends of, or, um, other interested parties including friends of the parks and other, and other partners. Chair, it could be through not just from seat, to seat funding through them because they may be able to bid for that. Yeah, yeah. it's source from other sources to cover that generally. Okay, any other questions on that one? No, good. Sorry, yes, the next one then, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the second item is acceptance of grant from the Department for Health and Social Care of £375,000 for 24-25, with an estimated to total grant value of £1.87 million over five years. The aims of this funding are to ensure that there is a comprehensive nationwide offer to help current smokers to stop smoking and increase the number of smokers engaging with effective quit interventions. There is also a recommendation to get, delegate authority to the Strategic Director of People Services, the Section 151 Officer, and in consultation with the Cabinet Member for Health, to enter all necessary contracts and agreements associated with this funding. Okay, so any, uh, so it's um, a partnership arrangement with the NHS, with, with, with public health, effectively, that this is, this is done with. Councillor Kerr. I was wondering whether this was including vaping as well as, as tobacco smoking and any other smoking. I, I'll ask the detail on that. I don't, I don't know. I would assume so, but I wouldn't like to say yes. I'll get back to you with that. Uh, what sort of other smoking were you thinking about, Councillor Kerr? Anything, anything you I should no tell us about? I have no experience of this, but I thought <laughs> I didn't want to exclude others. <laughs> OK, we'll get back to you on that one. Okay, so the next two are in relation to um, homelessness prevention funding, a, a continuation of previous arrangements. Anything to add? Um, there's, there is a, an initial ring fence revenue grant of 1.11 million, but it's been topped up to take account of UK pressure, so there's a further £312,000 as to top up to this uh, funding. A problem we're all aware of, and we should be supportive of any central government funding that kind of helps towards uh, dealing with it. Councillor Holmes. Councillor Holmes, uh, Nick Clover Ward. I uh, keep forgetting to do that, Chair, I do apologise. Uh, just to clarify, then, they, the, the government have increased the funding and they've topped that up. 
Right, okay, yes. so I wasn't quite sure where the top-ups come from. It's definitely government that's added the yeah. money on, right? Yeah, there's 1.1 initially, and then they've weighted it and given us another £312,000 more. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Rawson, then Councillor Khan. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about how, whether there are any sort of um, um, ties or conditions imposed on the funding and how flexible we can be in terms of using this funding to meet the needs of homelessness um, locally. So the funding is given for specific uses, ending rough sleeping by increasing activity to pre prevent single homelessness, reduce the number of families in temporary, temporary accommodation and reduce the use of bread and breakfast. But other than that, as long as it meets the grant conditions, that's what it should be used for. And that's currently dealt with by Derby Homes and Partners in relation to the outreach and stuff that they're doing, yeah? Yes, Councillor Khan first and then Councillor Kerr. Yep, yeah, Councillor Jangir Khan, Normanton Ward. I just want to specific ask a question on housing support fund. Uh, my understanding is, is it was very successful. Oh, we're, we, we're coming to that one next, so oh. that's all right. Uh, that's the last, on, that's the last one, isn't it? Okay. Um, we'll come to that and I'll bring you in first on that one, Councillor Kerr, on, on the prevention of homelessness. Thank you, Lucy Kerr, Little Overward. The, Homelessness is something which exercises a lot of people in the city. Uh, I was being asked at the weekend, for example, about how they could give a donation to actually support the work that the local authority is already doing um, in this area. So clearly publicity uh, that there is money, additional money coming in is something that people will be pleased to hear about. But there does also leave that question about people who believe that homelessness is something that they wish to contribute towards combating. Where can they put their funds? So I'll, I'll take advice on that, but I'm sure anybody talking that needs to can talk to Derby Homes and, and the team that the, the team that are dealing with it. Is that your recommendation? Uh, I don't know for that specific issue how we could do that, but I would I'll pull something together. To, I'll have a look at that and pull something together. I, it would be through Derby Homes, but I mean, if it came to us, we could passport it. Councillor Ray. Thank you, Chair. I just advise everyone, I think the Council is still a, a very big part of this, look at the diverted giving scheme, uh, which we did a lot of publicity on uh, when uh, I was a Cabinet member before in our previous administration. I believe that's something that's been carried on into this new administration. It's certainly something I'd advise everybody looking at. And Tony, if that's something that you're looking at, that's, that's the route I'd advise to go down. Okay, so I think we can welcome those two in relation to homelessness prevention. Uh, the final one is uh, acceptance of the, and the crucial word for, him, for me here is the final 2024 Household Support Fund. Yes, Chair, thank you. So it's acceptance of the final uh, allocation of the Household Support Fund of 2.225 million. On the 6th of March, in the spring budget, the Chancellor announced a six-month extension to the HFS to run from the 1st of April 24 to the 30th of September 24. Uh, the DWP confirmed the extended HFS together with the details of the grant award for each local authority. The Household Support Fund is primarily there to allocate support to those most in need, which we all know, with cost of energy for heating, lighting and cooking, food, water and other essential living needs in accordance with the scheme guidance. The DWP has advised lo local authorities to have the arrangements in place pretty quickly. So we've also asked for delegated authority of the final scheme plan to the Strategic Director of Peoples, the Section 151 Officer and the Cabinet Member for Children. Thank you. Okay, so my understanding is that it's also been used to support the, the HAF programme, the School Holidays, um, Holiday Activity Fund programme. And if this is the final allocation, then... Um, for me, Cabinet need to consider it's been a, a very useful and vital facility for some um, households in need and, and people in need. And I think we ought to be asking Cabinet as to whether they've considered or, are, or will consider uh, future funding for holiday activity programmes. Any thoughts on that, uh, Committee? Okay, I think it's fairly straightforward. Um, just to point out to Cabinet that uh, with it being the final funding, with the funds, uh, an allocation from that funding being used to support the holiday activity programmes, 
what are their plans, Cabinet's plans for um, maintaining some sort of activities in the future? Councillor Kerr. So could we use this as a, um, a, a, raise it as a budget pressure for the coming years and put it in those terms? Because I think that's what it would be. Um, and to ask Cabinet to include this as a budget pressure for future years. Yeah, because this, at the moment the, the allocation will only cover up to the cover the summer holiday period, I think. So, how do we raise it as a budget pressure? I don't think it's the finance team would need to raise it as a budget pressure. Should, should Cabinet consider that the holiday activity programme's worth maintaining? Is that how it works? Um, if, if you wanted to do it in year, it would be, you know, we wouldn't raise it through the MTFP because it would be in year. So you'd have to raise it before then for it to be considered, if you see what I mean. Because it, it would be setting a new budget for next year, so you'd miss the this year. Uh, so I think, Lucy, it's down that if we make the recommendation, it's down for the Cabinet to decide how they're going to deal with it, whether or not they think that it's a programme that they will be supporting in the future, and if so, how are they going to do it? Are they going to put it in as a budget pressure? Okay, Councillor Khan, sorry you wanted to come in on this. Thank you, it. Chair. I just wanted to ask the date, but the officer just told me that it's going to finish in September, but I'm just going to or elaborate on that, that this, pro, this housing support fund has been very successful within the community and some of the areas where the energy prices and cost of living going up and all that, and I think this something like some support like this should continue in supporting the vulnerable families and, and, the, and the residents in the city. So you'd support the recommendation to look to continue to uh, fund holiday activity programmes, yeah? Have you got that, Tom? Yeah. You can make something of that one. Okay. Any other questions, queries? Yes, Councillor Kerr. This has been a bit of a stop-start um, of this fund. You know, it appeared, and then it was extended, and then it was extended. And I think people have, have grown to <coughs> expect it will happen again. This does feel more final than it has before, and I... I just want to be sure that there's some way that the recipients of this round of funding, it is impressed on them that this isn't likely to be a safety net in this, in this form in the future, um, because it may change the way in which people plan their future budgets or if they're given advice on how to plan future budgets or other sources of funding. I think this is it's going to be important potentially for some people and I just want to make sure that is being built into the process as far as possible. I don't disagree with that but again I think it's, um, it goes with the recommendation to Cabinet that they need to think about uh, future funding and, and that's the sort of thing that they need to consider and, and cover off. So any other queries, questions? Okay, I'm conscious of time and uh, we've got a late item some uh, detailed discussion um, prompts me to think about uh, the, the going back to the um, uh, purchase of the property for homelessness is, that, is that's included in the confidential section the, the financial details and of the bidding etc yeah. yeah thank you chair Ian Fulliger head of strategic housing yes it's, it's in the confidential papers chair I didn't want to miss it. That was all we, we should uh, deal with that. Okay. So I think that concludes the um, general agenda for the um, for the council cabinet. Although there is a public paper on item um, on the on the late item. Do we do, do we, should we deal with that briefly? Um, because of the, mainly the detail is in the finances in relation to the late, the late item. So do you want to cover off the public section or the late item for me, please? Yeah, hello. Tommy Whitaker, Director of City Growth and Vibrancy. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot of detail um, in the confidential section, but I'm happy to um, give a, an overview of the public paper. Um, I appreciate it's quite a long and complex report, so I will do my best to summarise um, and then we can we can take questions in detail. Um, so um, the the report uh, deals with 
um, a revised proposal for delivery of the project Assemble Learning Theatre Scheme, which was the subject of the, the successful £20 million levelling up fund bid approved by the Department for Leveling Up Homes, uh, homes and Communities. Um, originally, um, members will be aware that the proposal was for um, delivering a new learning theatre on the site of the assembly rooms. Um, but the, the, the project that was approved was essentially for a learning theatre concept. The um, proposal goes into, um, in, the, in the report, sets out a revised proposal. Uh, members will be aware that the costs escalated significantly on the assembly room site and that was no longer deemed uh, a viable proposal. Um, and due to a number of, of uh, external factors. Um, this, pro this proposal sets out um, delivery of the project assemble across two um, schemes, essentially. Uh, one, which is um, a, re uh, a remodelling of the existing Derby Theatre site. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you um, at, the, at such an early phase, but my understanding was that the issue of... Um, of project assemble was assemble was dealt with when cabinet were asked to approve the re, the reallocation of the LUF funding yeah. to the Guildhall project effectively. Um, um, it's a recent, fairly recent cabinet meeting. But ultimately, when the when um, cabinet gave approval to bid for the LUF funding, the it was it was agreed on the basis that when when well, such times as there is a, a detailed proposal comes forward, it would be brought back to cabinet. So, I, I take the view that this is this report is not about project assemble, but it's about the allocation of the LUF funding to the Guildhall and the and the theatre project. Exactly, that's that's exactly right. I think what. Uh, it's, it's kind of a terminology point, isn't it? So the, the, the levelling up funding was awarded for a, a learning theatre, if you like, and cultural uh, heritage um, outcomes. The assembly rooms, if you like, uh, Project Assemble as originally conceived, um, is now subject to a discussion with the strategic development partner, which will be subject to another report. So this is dealing with the allocation of the levelling up fund project to Derby Theatre and the Guildhall. Um, and sets out exactly how we deliver the outputs. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct, but the levelling up fund has outcomes attached to it, um, and it was awarded for specific outcomes around the delivery of a learning theatre concept and associated outcomes. But then that was dealt with by the previous paper that agreed for the... Uh, to £20 million to be dealt with, to, you had to go through a, a change process. That's right. To allocate it to the Guildhall rather than a learning theatre. The, yeah. Because, is because there is no agreement with Luff, with the duo yet, that the, that the um, theatre is, in, is involved in the allocation of £10 million. The, the, look, the department currently have agreed the £20 million being allocated to the Guildhall programme, and there's another variation in the, in the proposal to include the theatre. The original concept was for a partnership between the University of Derby, Derby Theatre, and the, uh, and the council to deliver a series of outputs that are attached to the levelling up fund within a certain timescale with various technical recommendations around benefit cost ratios. So in order to, when you, the, the options that are being considered to enable us to still retain that levelling up funding means that this is the development of that proposal. But I'm right in thinking that the, the department um, have not consented to the, to the change in, in, in uh, allocations, the, to the change in funding? They... they consented to the revised project that involved Derby Theatre and the Guildhall in the original... In the, but in the not the split of 20, 10 and 10? No. Uh, not the precise detail of the split, but Derby Theatre was always part of that original project approval request back in okay, September. But they, I think we're splitting hairs here a little bit, but they, it's, it's clear in the report that there is, there is still a level of uh, acceptance and, a, and a, an MOU to be agreed with you look on, in relation to the allocation of the 20 million? So the, the project access, so the, the original project adjustment request that went into Department of Leveling Up was for Derby Theatre, 
and the Guild Hall. Um, it included both. And the original proposal was to include an extension of the Derby Theatre. That's not possible because of their existing lease. So the, the requirement, the, mem the memorandum of understanding that we enter into with DLUG is for delivery of outputs and the spend and the, the split between the two. So this project sets out exactly how we will deliver the outputs within the levelling up fund. But the difference is that um, the council will be the, the agency in responsibility for the guild hall, whereas it's undecided yet whether it will be the theatre or the university that will be the responsible body for the £10 million that's going towards the theatre. The council is the accountable body for the levelling up fund, so it's responsible for the £20 million. The del delivery of the Derby Theatre element will be through the University of Derby and Derby Theatre, of which they're the same group of companies. But it's a partnership arrangement with, to which, well, the report says that n neither has accepted full accountability. It's either the theatre will take on the responsibility underwritten by the university, or the university will take responsibility for the 10 million. Yeah, they will. And, but the point is that that will be governed by a partnership agreement between us and the University of Derby and the Derby Theatre that accounts for that money. We effectively pass for on the responsibilities that are sat, with, sat within the Memorandum of Understanding through that partnership agreement and grant funding agreement. With Derby okay, Theatre but just, just to be clear though, um, neither MOU has been agreed or neither partnership arrangement has been... Has been the MOU, we have a draft form and we have draft forms of all the documents. But it's not been agreed. No, that's what the subject of this paper is. That's but what this partnership, this is, that's what this cabinet report is asking, is for approval for cabinet to enter into those agreements. Wow. You need to make that agreement with the department, don't we? Yes, but we need approval to do that. Okay. Which is what this cabinet report is asking for. Okay, sorry to interrupt. So the, the report asks for, um, sets out the proposals for the Guildhall and sets out the proposals for Derby Theatre <coughs> and sets out the arrangements and asks, seeks approval to enter into that memorandum of understanding with DLUC and the necessarily contractual arrangements with the university. Again, um, we've got two councillors, so unfortunately we've got to leave to go on to a different meeting. Can, was there anything you wanted to raise specifically in relation to this before you have to leave? You sure? Okay, thank you. Sorry, do you want to finish off? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll not go into the detail, um, the, the detail set out in the report, but essentially the revised proposal, proposals enable us to deliver a same use proposal, which is, which is what DLUC required us to do. Um, it gives us a better benefit cost ratio. So because this was a competitive fund, we have to develop a benefit cost ratio within a certain tolerance for DLUC. Um, we have to still be able to deliver broadly the same outputs utilising the funding. Um, and um, it enables us to still deliver the learning theatre concept and bring back into use the Guildhall Theatre, which is essential in terms of the marketplace. Um, there are a series of recommendations that are set out um, in the report, um, essentially, um, and go, that goes into more details in the confidential annex, but enables, um, it's like seeking approval to grant £10 million for the Derby Theatre scheme um, and uh, to delegate authority to the strategic director of place um, to enter into the, necessarily con the necessary contractual arrangements, including the partnership agreement, um, to en enable to approve the signing of the MOU with DLUC, um, to approve the addition of the Guildhall Theatre refurbishment scheme to the capital programme, to approve the removal of the um, Hoyt 700. Uh, thousand project assemble learning theatre scheme capital budget and to delegate authority to the strategic director of place um, to explore options for operating the guild hall to optimize the financial operating position okay so the, the the numbers are the important bit here to a large degree and they're contained in the pension confidential items but there's just a couple of other issues i wish to just to clarify with you um, this this um, paper is it's a key decision to start with, isn't it? Yeah. There can be no doubt about that. Um, what you haven't caught off is why it's been brought as a late paper. 
Yep, I'm happy to do that. So um, the, it was brought as a late paper because essentially there are, there's a requirement to sign, in to sign up to the memorandum of understanding with DLUC within a specified time scale. And there was also a requirement to get approval from Cabinet to do that. Unfortunately, those two timescales don't align. Um, there's had to be a, a significant work been undertaken on developing feasibility work for both the Guildhall project and the University of Derby um, scheme, which um, then had to translate into a business plan and uh, technical calculations around a benefit cost ratio, which had to be negotiated with DLUC as well to make sure they were broadly happy with the proposals that we were putting forward before we brought those for approval. Um, we've also needed to negotiate the detail of partnership agreements, grant funding agreements, to the satisfa satisfaction of all parties, including DLUC, um, the City Council, the University of Derby and Derby Theatre, prior to seeking approval, to ensure that we could then um, meet the requirements of the D Department of Leveling Up um, requirements around timescales for the funding and delivery, but also the, uh, entering into the MOU within a timely matter. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible to do that um, for the March Cabinet, which we would have liked, or in time indeed to get this published last week. Um, these have been going, the discussions have been going to the wire essentially with, with DLUC on the MOU and others. So we've, we've had to bring some significant detail on the feasibility and cost. So um, I appreciate it's a complex project and it's late. Um, and I, it's not ordinarily the way we would like to do that, but it is um, with the, the negotiations with DLUC and others, it's not been possible to, to get it um, brought forward as soon as we would have liked. Okay, so and this is where I have some serious concerns, is that um, we've known the timescales for some time, because we were looking at back in March, it wasn't time to put it in in March, so we looked towards April, but then we didn't get it in time to issue the papers a week in advance. So we've known these timescales for a long while, we uh, still don't have any partnership arrangements uh, confirmed and signed and sealed and delivered. We don't have any MOUs signed and sealed and delivered. And yet we're being asked, or the Cabinet has been asked to um, agree to delegations to let that all happen and then just, and I can, if you can confirm this to me, there's no intention of bringing back the detail, i.e. any business plan, any um, details of the MOU or the final figures to be brought back to Cabinet. It's all going to be dealt with by way of delegation. Is that the case? No. So we will bring back the revised business plan that deals with the operating model um, for Guildhall. Um, so, the, sorry, I, I keep on There isn't a business plan at the moment, is there? There is a business plan, um, yes. Can you point is. me to where it is in the it's paper? It's not in the paper. There is a, a business plan that's been prepared by Amion. Um, that deals with the capital funding, um, and I can certainly provide that if that's required. So why, why would Cabinet accept that if there's no, if there's no paper? Amion, Amion should show those, that business plan, and, and unfortunately uh, there's a suggestion, or I'm suggesting, that um, the business plan doesn't stack up because the capital costs are not fully known, because in the course of development, we're only at Reba stage one, capital costs could in, uh, increase exponentially, and the report actually admits that they've no idea what the revenue implications of this report are. We do have outline implications for the revenue costs. We've got a, a business plan, a draft business plan that's being worked through. We've got costs at uh, an outline stage. Um, we've Sorry, got... and those, those revenue costs are shown when? They're not in this report, but we do have outline revenue costs, but it, you, you'll see in the report it recommends that 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 further work is done on the business plan? <laughs> well, yeah, there needs to be work because there isn't one, I think, is, is, is the issue, if I'm, if I'm honest. I'm, sorry, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to give you a hard time, but I'm trying to give, I'm trying to give the paper uh, proper scrutiny because it's got, well, it, it's not that perforated, there's, there's more holes in it than, than, than so I spread. I just kind of finish off a, a line uh, with with this at the moment, and I'll bring you in when uh, because we're going to look at in even more detail and look at the confidential stuff because um, you know this, the the issue around what's needed at the guild hall is is not a new one, and costs were worked out previously, and we'll go into those at some point. But um, 
Right, yes, God, let's um, we have time to think a little bit. Councillor Arfus, then Councillor Moore. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Oakwood Ward, I, I don't get this now. How, I mean, I look, I look around this board and I think we're all very capable councillors and we're all very capable wow. scrutiny members. But how can we properly scrutinise a paper when there's a, a business plan, but it's a draft business plan and it's still being worked on, but we can't see it and it's not in the report? And there are revenue figures, but they're not in the report and we can't see them. I think we're all good councillors, but I can't read minds. And we need that information before we can properly scrutinise this. And more importantly, I think Cabinet need that information before they can properly make a decision on this. So either Cabinet have got it and we haven't, which wouldn't be acceptable, and I don't think that's the case, or no one's got it. And how can a proper decision be made in that, in that nature? I just don't think that's acceptable. Uh, councillors has nicked most of my question. Um, so I will, I, will, I will ask directly. So um, the, the business case for this, um, will Cabinet see that business case before they make a decision on whether or not to give this the green light um, with the um, MOM, whatever it's called? Because if, if they, I don't see how we can ask them to make a decision without fully knowing what the business case is, if that makes sense. Like all this funding that will go to this project, and we, but we don't know what the, what, what the business case will be. Well, I have to say, my, my reading of the recommendations and the supporting evidence is that um, the plan is to delegate that to the Cabinet member and officers when, when all those things are known. Um, and that's my understanding, is not that, that's not how the, the Council normally operates. Um, Councillor Holmes, and then I've got another query I need to raise with you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Holmes, Mikkel Overward. So, OK. It isn't making sense, but further details have come forward to answer what I was going to ask before the officer sort of talked about the business case, because I was looking at, I've been looking at the revenue implications, and like you, I'm thinking, well, I've never known a project like this not to have revenue implications, and I just couldn't believe that there was, there was no detail here, in, even in the confidential, we've got to be careful what we say here, but what's in the confidential doesn't answer me that question either. And yet we're being told that there is that detail. So I'm not naive enough to think that every single nuance, every single detail, some of it highly confidential in terms of business arrangements in these kind of contractual negotiations and these deals is going to be played out in public or even in this, this board, whether it be pink papers or, or in the, the normal agenda. But it, we've got to have that kind of detail to have confidence. We have, and certainly the Cabinet have, and it just seems very strange not to have that kind of basic financial detail because it clearly exists, even if it's not fully formed yet. So I just don't understand how we could even consider this as a viable plan unless we have that. You see, and I, I agree. And actually, the report talks about um, the future revenue costs having to be subject to uh, further consideration under future MTFPs. Well, that seemed to me to accept that there will be a revenue cost. And when you think about it, when you look at what's proposed at the Guildhall, in a very sketchy detail of what's proposed, it's the consultants are suggesting business as normal. Don't change it. It's what it is. Um, we don't need to reinvent it. Do it. And what happened when it was in existence in the past, there was a considerable revenue cost to operate in the Guildhall. It never, it never paid for itself. And that would... That in the, these proposals is likely to be the situ, situation going forward. And that's before we start to look at the costs of the prudential borrowing that's being suggested. So we'll move on to that in a little while. But I need to just clarify a couple of things procedurally. We've clarified that it, 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 um, it is a key decision under those circumstances. Normally, when a late item is is brought forward, it would come to the chair of exec scrutiny to consider a waiver in relation to allowing it into the onto the agenda and, and particularly um, waiving calling on the subject or whatever. Can take some advice on why that's not been the case on this occasion. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can take that, chair. Um, 
It was considered, and um, we'd reviewed the forward plan entry and considered that although the title of the forward plan entry was Project Assemble, the content within the description of the decision to be made was covered by the forward plan and therefore whilst a late item would not require a waiver from the Exec Scrutiny Board Chair. Well, I hear that, but I have to say I don't agree with that. As I said, uh, this, is, this report is not about Project Assemble. Project Assemble, yes, was in the forward plan. Project, um, Project Guildhall and, Guild and University Theatre is not in the forward plan. So under those circumstances, it would need a waiver. And I've not been asked to do that. So um, I'm not happy about that, that scenario. And, and I'm not convinced by the argument that, well, it was, under there, it was in there under Project Assembly. It doesn't work for me. Councillor Ayr. Thank you, Chair. Just to add to that, 1.2 in this report, Project Assemble has been stopped. I think that, that says more than what we need to on this one. It's been stopped. This is a, a report. Yes, it mentions Project Assemble. I'll give it the credit of that at the start. The substance of this report, surely we can't be claiming, is about Project Assemble. It's about a project has its similarities, but it is a different project. And the announcement of uh, stopping Project Assemble was announced when, when Cabinet dealt with the a decision to reallocate the £20 million pounds to the Guildhall. Maybe the Guildhall and the University, but it's my contention that procedurally this, this is out of order. Okay. Um, right, Any else, anything else before we move on to confidential items? Councillor Kerr. Chair, I also had felt that this report was a bit sketchy in various places, as has already been mentioned. But one of the others that I wanted to highlight was um, some of the, what the costs are. Um, under 4.16, it talks about rewiring replacement of m and &E, presumably mechanical and electrical equipment, new lighting, AV, ICT, improved access. Um, and elsewhere, I've got the feeling that we may be blanking off the entrance from the, the marketplace in towards the market hall. And if that's being closed off, I think that has quite large implications for the, the dy dynamic viability of the market hall. And that doesn't seem to be discussed here either. Um, but I, I agree, Lucy, and there's a lot of risks identified in the risk list that are not dealt with in the report as to effectively how they're going to be dealt with. It says... Well, there's two other entrances, and we can signpost them to the other entrance as well. That, that's not it doesn't, good it enough. It doesn't then readdress... It's going to affect the business case. Sorry, Chair. It doesn't readdress the viability of the, the market hall and the dynamics and the... And, you know, there's, there are knock-on effects from here, which we're not exploring. Um, I'm also aware that that were heating systems within the building, which were replaced only at the during late part of, of 2019, by which time it was already closed... So is this M&E work actually replacing stuff that we probably borrowed for at the time and we will be borrowing for again? And it's, it's un I'm uncomfortable with it, Chair. The answer is, Lucy, we don't know because there's no business plan that explains the detail. And, and what is there in four or five lines that it does deal with in terms of a recommendation from consultants to, to just replace it as it was is, is there's insufficient detail there. But we're going to have to bring that out when we talk about the numbers and the confidential side of things. Okay. Is there anything else to say in the public section of this before we, before we move on? In that case, then, I have to uh, ask you to consider the exclusion of the press and public and to consider a resolution to that effect that under 100A of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be, public be excluded from the meeting during discussion of the following items on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of schedule 12a of the act and that the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. So in the course of reading that, I think everybody else has left. Can we can confirm that?